Hi everybody, I'll tell you about a short story uh, and it's real. So I was going through YouTube as usual, <clears throat> looking for some inspiration in music. And I was going through some of the, you know, the independent uh, music scene and musicians. Um, I came across to this particular channel uh, where a lady was singing jazz songs through Indian solfages. So solfages in, in, in uh, a simplistic term would be you know, the Swaras or the Saregama Pathanisas, you know, she was singing a jazz standard by the use of Indian solfage. So that was very new to me because um, I know a million people who does cover songs and different things. I only know a handful of people who actually can uh, memorize a, a register of a note and map it to a song's tune and then, you know, kind of deliver it. So that was very inspirational. And uh, then when I kind of scroll to her through her profile i i discovered few more things which was very interesting so first was a jazz song to indian solfage then it was a hindustani semi-classical song called chap tilak sung in hindustani standards and then there was a carnatic standard a semi-classical carnatic tune uh, and then there i saw some originals as well so i, I really uh, wanted to know this person and bring her on board to the Singapore audience and the world as well. So here we are. So welcome Chandana. Thank you so much Amber. Thank you so much to, for having me on this show. Great, great. Thanks for making your time for this. So Chandana, I mean this profile which I have, I have gone through, you know, the YouTube profile that you have, it's not restricted to a particular genre or style. It's wonderful to know that you have actually explored various genres and you have mastered it to such a level. Uh, now, I, my first question will be, where did it all start? It, it cannot be just like that. It must be coming from some very deep roots. So can you share with us? So primarily, I'm a Carnatic classical vocalist and I've had my uh, training uh, only in Carnatic classical. I've not had a traditional training in any other genre of music that I experiment or explore. Uh, my father is my first guru, Dr. S. Natarajamurthy, and uh, that's how my journey in music began. I started singing at the age of four or five or whatever. Um, and I knew that music was all that I wanted to do. Even when I was in school and college, I had uh, pretty much the clarity that this is all that I wanted to do in my life. And uh, uh, after I got married, so until about my 24th year, it was only Carnatic classical music and maybe a little bit of light music from the South Indian genres that I was exploring. But once I came to Bombay is when actually, uh, and this was back in Bangalore, so I, I am basically from Bangalore. And once I came to Bombay in 2006, that is when I started exploring uh, uh, in the sense, it was just uh, out of sheer curiosity. And also because there was sometimes a requirement to sound a little different from what I was actually sounding already. So some, sometimes they would say, can you sing like a very light uh, alap kind of a thing, which did not really require the intensity of the gamakas that I was singing in Karnatik and stuff like that. So that's how the exploration actually began. And I started exploring some of the Indian genres, like the folk uh, traditions and a little bit of uh, Abhanga tradition of Maharashtra. And uh, I was also trying to sing a few Sufi compositions like Chap Tilak and uh, uh, that's after that, I started performing with uh, some musicians from Bombay and I was collaborating with them on a few bands and uh, some of them were jazz musicians and that's how I got introduced to this whole idea of uh, the whole genre of jazz and blues and I was very very deeply fascinated by that and uh, I started exploring it but uh, I never uh, claim uh, to be a jazz singer or a Hindustani classical singer because I'm not really uh, any of those. I'm not uh, trained enough to, uh, you know, identify myself as a Hindustani classical singer or a jazz singer. Or, uh, but what I actually do is try to interpret a composition that I listen to in whatever genre it may be, and I try to translate it into a language which is closer to my learning and upbringing and tradition and I think that interpretation uh, kind of works for me. It is very fascinating for me to interpret it. So even when I sing um, say a Thumri, uh, it has a lot of Carnatic influences on it. So it cannot be very uh, 
purely called a thumri by the actual standards of a thumri but what it is is actually an interpretation and there is a little bit of blend of ragas that comes in and that is uh, probably uh, what also people like to listen to because it is a little bit of a uh, you know different kind of a sound from what they are normally used to listening to and i guess the jazz uh, compositions also when i translate it into the swaras which was actually taught to me by a friend of mine uh, and that's how i started exploring it and uh, yeah so i just put out the work that i was uh, working on and i would just put out those small little videos and uh, yeah that's how this journey actually is happening that that's amazing so so basically i share your view like they say ekomkar there's only one god there's one only one music so we people yeah. categorized into different different genres just for the ease to communicate but i think there's only one music uh, so it all binds us so so may i ask you i mean i was going through some of your songs you not only converted or transcripted the song's melody to indian solfeges you also improvised on that right so um yeah. it's it's a very rare thing to do these days uh, there are not uh, many improvisers so so how do you see improvisation why improvisation like what what's your idea about in, improvisation and inspiration to do that so basically when i listen to uh, a jazz composition uh, apart from the melody of course uh, it is actually the improvisation that draws my attention to it i mean a very well improvised composition actually stays with me for a long time um some of the some of the most beautiful uh, compositions that i have uh, you know a night in tunisia by charlie parker what i have kind of heard it so many times and it kind of uh, opens up a lot of uh, avenues in my head to explore and to get more creative uh, so these are the kind of things which i am really like i mean i'm really fascinated by and also the strength of carnatic classical music and one of the most important things that we are trained in is to explore explore something to improvise on a particular idea or a concept so for me interpreting a jazz standard only by translating it into swaras is as important as exploring what is happening underneath like some of the chords that are happening underneath the chord progressions i may not really understand technically but going by uh, the way the chords progress what i do is i pick up a raga that kind of weaves those chords together and i find a raga which i can explore and that journey and that exercise is very fascinating interesting and very uh, fulfilling in a sense for me so that is how i started exploring uh, the improvisational aspect of those compositions and it is a slightly uh, it's not exactly the way uh, again uh, uh, the way a jazz musician would actually explore because they would stick to the chord progressions but when i do it it is like i you know like stitch together all the notes of those chords and um, more like explore the raga that is created from it yeah that is that is basically a very good approach and uh, there, there is that's really a good idea can i can i uh, ask you so for let's say people who are listening and i'm quite sure there will be a lot of singers as audience uh, and musicians as well so for the layman uh, and especially people who are singing classical music like carnatic music and hindustani like uh, they may understand uh, classical music indian classical music but they may not know a lot of jazz and they would feel that jazz is a different world altogether like uh, east and west we understand like eastern vocals and keyboard played with that but completely two different styles blend together so have you seen some commonity like where indian classical be it carnatic or hindustani actually connects to jazz is there a common ground that you have discovered uh, for for the audience so uh, see from a listener's perspective um the carnatic classical tradition itself um has certain elements like for example there is an improvisation of a raga and then there is a composition that is rendered and this composition is a fixed composition it is it does not allow us to um improvise much the composition itself or the song itself because it is already fixed and it is written by a composer or what we call as a vagyakara which means that he has written the notation for the song and it is meant to be sing exactly that way 
and then you have the other improvisational aspects like the nerval the kalpana swara and all of those now if you look at a jazz composition also there is something called the composition itself which cannot be changed maybe you can add a few improvisational elements in treating that composition but the the core composition remains as it is and what is done around it is the improvisational part of it so also what happens in carnatic is like you sing an introduction to a raga uh, you sing the introduction to the composition in the form of a raga similarly even in the jazz uh, concerts you have a little bit of an introduction that is played to the composition where the listener is introduced to the various um, you know uh, the beautiful uh, explorations that one could expect in the composition or how the artist would like to introduce the composition to you with a set of notes that are in the composition already and maybe a little bit of exploration here and there which is what happens with the raga and the kriti when the raga is introduced and certain aspects of the kriti are introduced to the listener through the raga and after which when we start exploring the kalpana swaras as we call it it is more or less in kind of a um uh, when there is an interpretation of some of the phrases interesting phrases of a kriti or a composition and what we see in jazz um standards being explored after the composition is rendered is also similar to this kind of an exploration so for me the format wise uh, there are certain formats or forms of exploration that come together uh aesthetically uh, how it appeals to uh, me uh um, may not appeal to another listener or uh, may not appeal to the one who wants to interpret it in a different genre but what happens is that uh there is a little bit of a take away for everybody when you present a composition in such a holistic way where there is an introduction where is the composition which is already set and there is an interpretation again and it's an exploration of uh, rhythmic exploration of um this composition in an impromptu manner uh, about rhythm what you said i i think that's a common ground because uh, i think in this whole uh, world of music afro cuban music and carnatic music are known for the rhythmic standards i mean they set set the bar right especially carnatic music uh, i mean we know of, i mean very simplistic term konakol uh is the language of rhythm right and uh, when you explore into it it subdivides a one and the in between notes or in between time intervals so well that it raises the bar of any kind of rhythmic pattern so i think jazz comes from afro music and carnatic with its great rhythm both these afro and uh, carnatic music has a very advanced science of rhythm so i guess that's one of the things that connects very well and yeah i mean uh, the challenge over here i don't know whether you'll agree um is to bridge the gap by by indian music is perceived to be a melodic music and jazz is more like a harmonic music so that is where the challenge is and that actually creates a world of possibilities like you are already doing it yeah definitely uh, so yeah carnatic is more of a a linear indian classical music in fact has a very linear movement um but uh, i think jazz you more look at it like uh, you know there are many layers from which you can create something right something can emerge something can be creatively picked from a bed of the harmonies that are already there the bed of chords that are already there can you just uh, share some of your work that that you are um that you have covered so far and you plan so um the most recent uh, thing is that i have released a single of mine and um, it is in the light classical semi classical kind of a genre if we can if we have to put it under a genre and it is called zalim i have written the lyrics and i have uh, composed the melody and of course sung it i have also kind of co-produced it along with a friend of mine who is the actual music producer of this composition so we just had a release and we also um, had a live interpretation of that composition because that uh, you know lent itself so much to uh, an improvised version as well uh, so that is something i just did in the recent past and uh, apart from that there are also certain teaching projects that i have been involved in for the last uh, one year especially during the lockdown 
so there is this organization called Vox Guru. It's a, it's a YouTube channel as well, and uh, it's an app for Carnatic classical music. And I have uh, worked on uh, the on devising some uh, lesson modules for them based on ragas. And uh, these are some of the projects that I've worked on in the recent past. And um, what I have in the future are a few other singles of mine which I want to work on. I uh, also want to release an album of mine which is uh, uh, a confluence of devotional or uh, bhakti or uh, spiritual poetry from across different uh, genres of the country written by uh, the poets across the country again. So that is something that I want to work on in the future. So you just mentioned about Zalim and I have heard that on loop. So it's beautiful song and I would like to know that how it actually evolved in the sense like how you wrote the melody and what were the considerations did you record it in your home studio and how was, was it produced? So um, basically the melody of the composition came to me uh, about I think four five months ago when I was just thinking of you know certain uh, swara patterns in this raga which is called Sarasangi. So the this raga in the Carnatic tradition is identified as Sarasangi and I think this composition is based on Sarasangi. And uh, the melody came in and the lyrics almost came in along with the melody. And uh, the song is actually about, uh, you know, a woman who has been left in a place of distress and in a place of uh, turmoil and anguish. Uh, and uh, the message that uh, she conveys is that uh, one needs to be left in a, peace, uh, a peaceful place, in a place of calm and peace before one is uh, about to, like because sometimes we cannot take everyone along with us in our lives. And as students, we leave our teachers, sometimes we, uh, you know, leave behind friendships, we leave behind some relationships. And sometimes there are children who just have to leave their parents for whatever reasons and uh, which is probably the most cruel thing to do but then what is important is to leave behind the people you leave behind in a place of uh, calm and peace so that is what the message of the composition was all about so i wanted that kind of a turmoil to come in the initial section where uh, I sing all those, uh, you know, uh, the gamakas and everything. Uh, I just I wrote the composition in a way which brings out that kind of a frenzy and anguish. And what happens towards the end of the song is that uh, it's also uh, true that you know, in prayer, uh, we grow closer to the people that we leave behind, and we also uh, kind of uh, the pain that actually dwells in us. It takes us closer. It makes us uh, pray harder. It makes us uh, forgive. It makes us uh, love harder. You know, so uh, that is the uh, that is what the effect of the second paragraph is. Therefore, it mellows down as the composition progresses. It starts uh, with a lot of frenzy, but it ends in a place of calm and peace. So that was basically how I wanted the composition to flow. And uh, once the lyrics were written, I went into a studio and I recorded the rough draft. And uh, Mr. Pani Narayana, who is an incredible veena player from Hyderabad, I've worked on him uh, with him on a couple of uh, projects before. And I requested him to play the veena because that sound was uh, something that I was hearing in my head. And once I did that, I reached out to my dear friend Omkar Patil, who is an incredible uh, music producer, singer, multi-percussionist, multi-instrumentalist. And uh, he very graciously agreed to come on board and uh, uh, since I already had the Indian elements in the composition of the song, I wanted the production to have a little bit of a contemporary approach. And uh, although we did want a tabla and you know we wanted it to be treated also in a manner where it was not a complete light classical piece but it also had a contemporary approach. So that is how the song came about and um, very happy and of course the kind of days and times that we are living in given the uh, you know the covid world that we are living in uh, it's very difficult for us to kind of uh, get a sponsor or you know get that kind of a funding to make videos which justify the songs and i kind of keep uh, talking about it a lot these days especially to create awareness also amongst viewers and listeners that uh, the independent musicians when they bring out a song sometimes they end up spending more money on the video 
to justify the audio and then to you know uh, to sell the audio or to make people listen to the audio because gone are the days when we actually just shut our eyes and listen to the song we need a visual medium for that so i would request listeners and viewers to kindly go and check out the songs on the digital platforms as well which they are actually meant for which for which we are actually making those songs you know um, of course i understand the song can also be viewed but let us also try and see if we can just you know uh, where the song can just be heard as well because there is so much that it can so much of imagination can come through that listening experience and i think that is something i wanted i, I do i do keep talking about a lot these days uh, so but still since we had to kind of put it out on platforms like youtube i worked on a lyrical video and this is some a craft that i have developed in the last uh, uh, few months because of uh, you know constantly having to put out videos so i edited the lyrical video myself and you know put something that could you know go out as a youtube video and after which of course we also worked on a live interpretation of the composition because we wanted to interpret this composition live and again the opportunities to actually perform it live are almost nil now because uh, the the in person concerts have still not really opened up uh, so we thought we'll just get into a studio and perform it live for the view, uh, viewers and audiences as well and also you know um, bring out another video yeah Actually, you have uh, triggered few thoughts over there. Like, I would like to share that uh, yeah. there was a time, like these days, uh, fine art-based music, like jazz, classical, these are not lifestyle. Although it is supposed to be a lifestyle, music, uh, Indian classical music is a lifestyle. Uh, yeah. But in the 1950s or 60s or before that as well, when uh, TV and radio was not so much commercialized, jazz, blues, Indian classical was a lifestyle, even for common audience. Like we had All India Radio, you know, uh, bringing out this beautiful material of, uh, you know, jazz, blues, Carnatic, Hindustani. And in the morning we would, you know, open our eyes hearing that. But now we would open our eyes with something else, which is very different from what yeah. our culture or even cultures of the world uh, gave as inheritance. I mean, uh, I, I was just off the, uh, off the hook. I was thinking that there are save tiger, save elephant, save animal, endangered species projects being funded by government and various commercial houses. There should be a save artist project that should be at the forefront because yes, yeah. art is endangered, endangered right now. We are actually compromising art and artistic people for all commercial purposes. It's, it's very ironic because for almost every, for everything art is required. I mean, if, even if there is, you're selling a bar of soap, it is with some music, right? And that music is either being digitally produced by an artist or it is being actually sung or played on by certain set of musicians. If you are trying to endorse a cricket match, it is along with music, right? If you're, if you're selling something, if you're talking about something, everything has music which is like the uh, bed that is on, on, on which everything is being spoken or told or, you know, sold or whatever. But unfortunately, when it comes to the uh, when the independent musicians put out their work and it is not really commercial then that is when actually there is a difficulty because now artists are required we were requested during the COVID time so many times uh, me and a few friends of mine to do free work uh, for what? for things like awareness about how it is important to stay at home you know you sing something and then you talk about how important it is you know you sing about you sing a little bit and then talk about but we are not really paid for that. None of those endor endorsements we are paid for. We just have to do it free of cost. So that kind of an expectation from artists is unfair. Uh, I know that the, pro the production costs don't change. Um, you know, nothing changes uh, and neither do our expenses change. So at a time when it is difficult for us to do live concerts, at least through these mediums, it is an opportunity for us to earn that much for the month or for the coming months or something like that. So it is important that, you know, it is valued with a certain fee. 
and a fee that is kind of uh, a respectful fee as what I would like to put it. Yeah, I mean, few yeah. few things over here, like I did a, a music as a business course from Berkeley, Berkeley College. The first line of that, uh, it was an online course. So the first line of the video said that whenever you are playing a piece of music or you're singing, somebody is earning money. Unfortunately, yeah. in most of the cases, the independent musicians are not earning that money. Some companies, maybe YouTube yeah. or some other place or some players are earning that money. So efforts needs to be spent and everybody is in this, this should be in this initiative to ensure the source, the artist is taken care of. That's one thing I, I want to share to everybody over here. And another thing is, and this yeah. is not about the music companies, this is not about the big organizations. This is about the society and the people. We artists are taken for granted because everybody sings. Okay. The place where I come from, Kolkata, a person is born, he's either dancing or he's singing. Okay. And I'm quite sure it's the same in your place as well. So everybody takes us for granted. Oh, he sings, but what does he do for a living? This is the perception. We sing and we play and we are specialized and we are professional in our job. And that calls for a remuneration. This concept Whenever it's you know placed forward, people take a back, back foot. So this is uh, unfortunately yeah. more in India than outside India. Uh, over here in Singapore, even in US, I have observed people that they understand that, okay, this is a skill uh, and that needs to be remunerated. Okay, and this understand from the very uh, first word of it. But in India, I think there's too much of uh, assumptions about you know skills being taken for granted. I don't know whether you face such experiences, but now with this, uh, it leads me to the next uh, next uh, uh, inquiry. So you mentioned about a music school that you are associated with, or or you have uh, close uh, participation. Uh, tell us about the music school and tell us um, what NRIs all across the world can 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 learn from it, or can how, how do they contact you and everything about it. So uh, basically this um, app that I'm talking about is an app called Vox Guru. It is a very popular app and uh, it's, they also have a very uh, well running YouTube channel. So basically uh, what I have contributed, so this, this app works uh, towards the opportunities, creating opportunities for students to learn music, even digitally, even on a, an app. Uh, so there are various programs, there are various, uh, you know, courses that are offered on that particular app. What I have done is I have helped them, uh, like I've designed and uh, I have contributed to the content and the development of one particular aspect of that course, which is called World of Ragas. So uh, basically there is like uh, a raga that is chosen and then there are various aspects of that raga that are introduced and draw, taught to the listeners. So right from the, the simplest of compositions to how one could explore that raga, right from the basics of what the swaras of the raga are, are and up to the uh, ability to be able to understand what improvisation in that raga because everything cannot just come overnight. But uh, it is a course which is kind of almost begins with the introduction of the notes of the raga and ends with uh, opening up the student to uh, start understanding how to explore that raga in manodharma or what we uh, call is like creative manner. So I've worked on a few ragas and uh, that that is what kept me busy through most of my uh, uh, lockdown period. And uh, apart from that, there is also another foundation called Giridhar Udupa Foundation for which I have done something similar. But that is more uh, to do with the basics of Carnatic classical music, only just the basic study. The third uh, thing that I'm doing is, of course, I've been teaching on Skype. And these are my personal lessons and I, I do, um, you know, take in students. I usually do not teach beginners uh, because uh, I believe that teaching beginners should have a little bit of, uh, you know, the personal, in-person kind of a medium, especially when we are teaching children. We should actually sit next to them and you know that in, that's important that we, te we teach in that manner. Uh, so what I, uh, I usually take up you know intermediary to senior students where you're learning varnams and, 
And Carnatic classical music is the only thing that I'm really um, entitled to teach because I have not learned the other genres of music systematically. So I only teach Carnatic classical music and uh, those interested can approach me on my, you could check out my website which has my contact details. Otherwise you could even write to me on um, chandana.sisla at gmail.com. I'll share the details in the description with you all. Yeah, for the audience, uh, I will leave all the details on the description so that you get an avenue to reach uh, Chandana and her projects. Okay, Chandana, the last question. Uh, so, what will you, what will be your advice to a person, uh, let's say a, a beginner, uh, a kid? Uh, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll just cut that. Um, okay, so so. <clears throat> This leads me to the last question. Uh, I, I have actually two questions. Uh, let's say I have a I have a kid. So what should I what should I train my kid on? Like there are so many choices. There's Indian classical, there's jazz, and all that. I mean, how should a career of a music student start? That's part A of the question or the first question. The second question is, I'm a simple karaoke singer like I'm one of those million faces and I want to learn a little bit more about music what would be your advice to me yeah so to begin with to answer your first question uh, it's extremely important that uh, we start learning one particular classical art form uh, instead of learning two or three parallelly so because the classical art forms are extremely rigid and they have a certain grammar and they have a certain um, you know there is a particular way in which you understand and you develop concepts in the minds of children about what Shruti is all about or what Tala is all about or what uh, a Raga is all about what the emotion that you associate with the Raga is all about there is a certain method there is a certain organized way in which we uh, teach this to children. So if two or more parallel genres of music are introduced to the children as a form of study, then it could be very confusing. So it is important that uh, whatever genre of classical art form of music, be it Karnatic or be it Hindustani or be it jazz or be it the western classical art form, the, that particular art form the child should be allowed to pursue for about seven to eight years before they start exploring other genres of music. But even before all those things, it is extremely important to identify if the child is interested, if there is an aptitude, and if they are interested to do it. Uh, you know, because it, it shouldn't be forced upon just because we are in a different country and we want to make sure our kids are rooted, you know, they are, in, in, I mean, they are in connect, uh, connected to their tradition. Just because of these reasons, we shouldn't force the child to uh, sing or learn a certain art form. It's important that we make sure that the child is really interested. Otherwise, we could lose them forever. They will do it for about a couple of years and then we just lose them forever and they never get into music ever again. Uh, so, so to begin with, yes, you ha it is important that you, you know, introduce them to uh, one particular genre of music, of classical uh, form of music. The second uh, question that you asked me was, um, it is, see a lot of us, we are singers, we can just sing, I mean there are innumerable people in the world, we are all, we, because music is something that comes very naturally to us, when we are happy we all hum a song, okay, irrespective of whether you are a singer or a non-singer or you are in any other profession, when you are just happy you hum a song, you listen to a song when you are feeling sad or you cry when you are uh, attached to that melody or you know the, the melody kind of invokes certain, certain uh, feelings in you but if you want to take ahead your musical journey into a more systematic path that is when the classical traditions come into place because what classical traditions do is <coughs> apart from introducing uh, these concepts that we just randomly sing and do in a very scientific and a systematic manner apart from that they also inculcate discipline in us because 
the classical traditions are so rigid and they actually require so much of attention and so much of time that we need to give them give to them for practice that it inculcates a certain uh, discipline in us that you have to wake up early in the morning if you have to do this kind of a practice you have to dedicate one hour every day for this kind of a practice which means that you're also sacrificing on something else so you're learning how to do all these things so it prepares us for a life that is a little more disciplined and little more organized and little more systematic uh, than we just listen to a song and we just sing it for our joy that is okay but if you want to take it up in a more systematic way i think learning one classical art form be it carnatic or hindustani or the western classical is absolutely necessary hindustani or the western classical is absolutely necessary yeah i completely agree with you learning is also entertainment there's fun of learning so i think uh, very rightly said and thank you so much for the insights I'm sure it will benefit so many people Thank around you, us. Thanks Thank so you so much, much for having me on this show. Thanks a lot. Re Zalim, 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 zalim